<laughs> That's enough. All right. Great. Let me meet that wow. real quick. That's been a long time. I think it's been about 20 years since I've actually like watched it, the intro and everything. You know, I thought the intro was appropriate, right? So my youngest son, Nolan, graduates this week. And uh, oh my that, oh. that, that graduation piece is a really, uh, you know, it's it's a touching moment. Brings what, me what are they, what they going to do? I mean, they can't get together. Well, they, well, it's starting to open up a little bit now, right? Not here. I mean, we're going to do a little drive-through graduation ceremony where we oh. run through the uh, the parking lot of the school, pick up a diploma with his cap and gown on, and uh, we'll come yeah. back here and have a little graduation party at home, a little barbecue. You're welcome to come. Yeah, <laughs> I <laughs> skipped mine. Your graduation? I skipped my graduation just because it was like I had a chance to get a to hitch a ride down to L.A., so I said, I'm going to do that instead, and it was like two days before. <laughs> I no, like, I go to L.A. or do I want to go to I'll go to L.A. <laughs> OK, this is the perfect place to start our conversation then. Yeah. Like, well, all right. So we didn't need to introduce you, but um, I thought the, the video was an appropriate way to kick things off today. So oh, awesome. let me just say hi to the folks real quick here. Um, for those of you just joining us, we uh, this sort of tradition of a daily conversation has been something that I've loved mostly because I have people near and dear to my heart that inspire me and I miss them. We've all been quarantined for a long time. And yeah. this guy and I, over the last couple of years, I've developed a bond with this man that I feel like he's my brother. I love this man so much. And since we have to be separated by a few states, we're going to uh, just connect here via Zoom and let you guys be a fly on the wall and voyeuristically check in on a conversation with my dear friend, Kelly Kiki. Hey, man, how are you? Yeah, we met down on the islands. That was that's, the first time we actually met. That's right. right. We were doing that uh, four-day festival down there. And that was amazing. You've done it since again, haven't you? I have. Yeah. 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 It's not the same without you there, though, you know. <laughs> but, uh, I, uh, but at that same point. Oh, how no, much I, did I pay you for that? I mean, it wasn't. Honest, it I was, paid you a lot for that, didn't I? What I, I had you pay me, and then I had Jen pay me a little bit, too. So that, <laughs> yeah, that's that, right. Holy I, crap. At that point, you were uh, not even engaged, and uh, but I did get to meet your girlfriend, Jan Attar, at that point, and uh, and she too is like family to me. You you know what? In all honesty, um, you guys have uh, her family and your family welcomed me at your wedding, like we'd all been together for you know decades. So I thank you for the kindness and the warmth. Oh man, and it was such a great treat. I mean, you came in, you were like dead tired. <laughs> Came in right into the you know, right into the party and, and then just got on a plane and left. Right, you left the next morning and went right back. That's right. But the only reason I went was I came in to get my uh, my signature series, the new Brad Gillis guitar picks. Those are the signature series <laughs> guitar picks. Do you make him use these for yeah. on stage now? <laughs> you tell him, Brad, we're not going on stage unless you use these guitar picks. That's right. right. That's right. I love it. Yeah, I have my own with my face on them too. Do you? Yeah. Oh man. I thought it would be I thought it'd be appropriate to where is that thing? There it is. Oh look at that. It's a caricature of you. <laughs> oh, I love it. It's a base pick. Yeah, exactly. Oh. And then on the back side, of course, I I got the band. And so you know what I had to, I had to do that. <laughs> that's an that's an easier swag throw than a drumstick because yeah. you're not gonna get sued if so you hit somebody with a pick, right? Yeah, that's right. That's... Unless I poke their eye out or something like that, or you know. You hit them with a pick and they come back with a big gash on their head like, oh, my God. Yeah, that probably does happen. Have you been sued for a drumstick yet? Oh, God. Uh, back in the 80s, I, I I hurt some people, I think, and yeah. it was, I had to stop doing that. Yeah. Mark Shulman and I, but Shulman's got major, I think he's got like a million dollars of insurance set up for that now. God, so, no. Yeah. Oh. I, I, the only people I've really hit in the last couple of years are our singer's wife, unfortunately. And that's, that's ouch. Weird. Yeah. I try to throw her the stick. So, so she'll throw it back. But, you know, it, uh, anyway, I am. Uh, well, let's, you know what? Let's talk about your graduation. Let's go back to uh, your formative years in school. Tell me a little bit about uh, what Kelly Kigi decided to do as a young teenager. I graduated in 1971. I was in a small town in Oregon. Okay. Uh, um, outside of Eugene, Elmira, Oregon. I was only up there for maybe a year and a half because my parents, you know, were just, they had this burning desire to, to move from Los Angeles. Uh, in 1969, my father, you know, would just like, they bought property up there in Oregon and they just had to leave in the middle, in the middle 
of my junior year, which oh. was a tragedy for me. Right. Because I had, you know, my whole life was down there. That's why I decided, uh, I was just telling you about this. That's why I decided to leave, you know, and not really even graduate because I really didn't know anybody. There wasn't any, a huge bond except for maybe two or three people. Yeah. And I just, you know, when before graduation, you have that whole weekend, week, you know, off prior to the ceremony. And I just, you know, there was a relative that was up there visiting and they said, we're going back to LA, you want to hitch up? And I just said, I'm with you, you yeah. know? So I went back there for the summer, played in, you know, uh, two different bands, you know, I was a singer in one and, well, yeah. actually I was singing in both bands. I just let the drummers play. And How did I you get those gigs? Did you already know these cats from when you were there before? I, I knew, I knew a few people that, you know, they knew I was in town and they said, yeah, we got, the, you know, let's, you know, let's play, let's jam and did a few gigs and it was it was it was pretty cool but i did feel like i missed something in the graduation even though it, i didn't have a huge you know attachment back there it yeah. was heartbreaking for me to leave you know uh in april of my of my junior year oh yeah I, man that's when you're establishing all your friendships i still go back to my my you know my parents my mom just passed so oh. you know but um but, you know, when we would talk, I'd go, why did you do that? Why did you feel like you had to pull me out of school and do that? And they were like, oh, I can't remember that. It was like, oh, my oh, God. It, most of the times, it's just a torch of the kids, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I, were you up? So you were playing music in high school already? Oh, yeah. And so how about when you were in L.A. before you split for Eugene? Absolutely. I was in a couple of different bands, but there was, a you know, a special band that I was in um, playing like, you know, MC5 and oh, yeah. all sorts of stuff like that, you know, like uh, Zeppelin, of course. And, and um, it was great. And I was singing. So, you know, for, the, for a lot of those bands, I was singing in it. So that's that's why now people like say, you know, do you do you like playing? You like singing? I, you know, it's like I, I love the challenge of doing both right now. But but I um, definitely I feel like I'm more of a singer than I am a drummer. Yeah, well, you know. People would not assume, right? They see you back there playing drums, but because Night Ranger is a, a unit of really you and Jack singing these leads, uh, right. my friend Jim Jelvig, he's a music educator and musician up in, in the UK, sent me a question for you asking, because there are so many talents in that band, but two primary songwriters, who decides to come into the band and say, um, you know, who's going to sing this one? Who, who decides? Do you have, I think he said, do you rock, paper, scissors it? I know the answer, but I wanted to hear you say it. But, well, you know, um, we, get, we get this question a lot, too. But what we do is um, basically, you know, when we're writing the songs, somebody finds, you know, their, you know, their person they either attached to it or they start singing it and it starts getting, you know, they start getting comfortable with it. And we're, you know, we're not about to fight about stuff like that. We don't care. So, but um, a lot of times we do split stuff. So that's been like kind of our M.O., in the last 15 years or so, at least the last four or five records. Like trade We split, off. like I'll take, I'll take a verse and then he'll do the pre-chorus and then we'll sing the chorus together, of course. And so that's how it happens, you know. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, a lot of times it's like, man, I really feel like I can, you know. And so we'll, we'll be really lenient about that and say, yeah, that's cool. You take it, you know, or I'll take that verse and then we'll sing the chorus together and then you come back and sing the second verse like that. It's, it makes it interesting. We're lucky to have two lead yeah. singers in the band, but it kind of keeps it, you know, going. Interesting Not only life. interesting. Hey, well, it's interesting for the crowd and for you guys, but also it shows a lot of respect that you have for each other. You know, I've watched you and Jack together off stage, backstage, you know, at the wedding, just hanging out, and you've got a lot of respect for each other. This is not something you figured it out. You know, most dynamics well, of lead singers, you know, that yeah, doesn't, that doesn't mean, work that way. You know, it happens sometimes. Sometimes we just we just go. I don't think you're really singing that right, or you know, vice versa. Not very often, though. Yeah. But we because we really know when somebody's got it. We yeah. you know we want we don't want to mess with that dynamic. We love it. So that's part of you know being a family. Yeah. And, and do, you do so much traveling and so much living together. You really have to be you know pretty up you know. I don't know what is it, forthright and magnanimous. You know? Yeah. Well, you know, I think uh, I, there are very few bands that can have a balanced relationship, right? Where people's um, 
feelings aren't getting hurt, right? Yep. And, and uh, you know, there's a diplomatic way to do that for sure, but you know, we can get to all that. I just wanted to ask the question about the singing part because you mentioned you're primarily yeah. a singer. You know, you know, you think of yourself as a singer. So when you grew up in high school doing Zeppelin tunes and MC5, um, and when you went back to LA, you mm -hmm. just jumped That's right in. Right. You got a, got a couple of gigs. So were you doing like backyard parties, or how do you, how are you playing gigs? Well, um, you know, like at uh, Eagles, you know, okay. Eagles halls and, and things like that, and they would have gigs for people our age, you know, 18, 19, you know, in the park. It was okay. a couple, you know, gigs that they'd have like rock and little stages happening. We'd go out there and do that. And, um, and you know, in high school too, it was funny when we were doing the MC, MT5 stuff. It was after football games, the oh. dances that would happen afterwards, right? So that was the music that was happening in right. 70, you know, 1970, 71, like that. So it's like, if you can just picture people coming to, to yeah, we're going to, we're going to go dance, you know? So we would do Doors, okay. we would do MC5, we would do Zeppelin. It's like, can you really dance with some of that stuff? I don't but it, think so. But it's still you know, for the but you could get high to it. Yeah. <laughs> you, could, yeah. you know, you could do that. Yeah. You know, and, and that's basically what we were doing. We were like, you know, puffing a lot and other stuff, you know. It's party uh, rock. Oh, my God. You know, and uh, sometimes we'd go, what happened? You know, the next day we'd like, wow, you know, or some guy decided to record you know, one, one of those nights when we were doing MC5 and some of our own originals, it was scary. Do you still have <laughs> any of those recordings? No. Oh, man. I, I don't. Somebody I don't. out there does. Somebody yeah. does. I bet you, your sister, like your, your sister have any recordings like that? No. I'm no. going to find her. But she was at one of the early gigs that I did back, way back in junior high school. She used to come to those gigs and yeah. there were like dances and, you know, at eight, nine at night on Saturday and we'd play. I played one and uh, it was fun. It was great. So, okay, so you were singing back then, but obviously you knew how yeah. to play drums at that point. Didn't have to play drums. Um, I, I didn't feel like I could really cover the vocal. At the same you know, time. It, yeah. But, and, and then, you know, then I'd go back to and forth. There was a lot of band, you know, you'd do like a few gigs and then the band was split up and they'd, they'd go and do, you know, people go do other stuff and I would go back playing drums you know? okay. so I mean that's kind of what I did I never really was without playing drums and singing for very long you know so you, but, uh, you grew but up then take a lesson after vocal? that summer after that yeah okay yeah. so after that summer after I graduated I went back to Oregon just for a, a short time you know in fall of that year 1971 and got asked to join a band and you know singing and playing Okay. So we had a lead singer, a chick, um, Gloria Gold was her name. Oh, great rock yeah, name. Great singer, man. Really great singer. So, and there was a lot of other singers in the band too. So we were really well-rounded. We had a lot of good vocalists. I would cover, you know, um, Creedence Clearwater and okay. stuff like that. Because it was, you know, we had to, we had to cover stuff that was happening at the time. So. Yeah. And we were making money, you know, and traveling around. Traveled all around the Northwest and Nevada and up in, uh, we got gigs um, up in uh, uh, Tahoe, you know, okay. over that winter and we kept going into the next year and it was, it was pretty cool. We got stuck up in, uh, up in, uh, where was it? Uh, Mount Rose in, uh, in uh, outside of Reno okay. in a snowstorm. And we were up there for four or five days. And I remember, you know, lost the keys in my car, you know, uh, uh, when the snow started going, we were out there in the parking lot having the, you know, snowball and I lost the keys out of my car. Yes. Well, the guy came through and, and you know, cleared out the parking lot overnight and, the, and blew my keys onto my car. No. Yeah. All right, so there's... It was like we came out and it was like, you know, three feet of snow, right? Wow. We're up in like 8,000 feet. How in the hell did that happen? That's nuts, Who knows? man. Yes. Yeah, Somebody's looking out for you. Buried all the keys. So I, when I when I went to brush off the snow on my car, whoop, the keys fell oh, that's down there. I was like, man. what the hell? Wow. So, so you know, that was you get trapped in the blizzard. Yeah. But uh, and so you're out, you guys like travel in a truck and bring all your lights and PA and that kind of thing on those those type of yeah. gigs. Yeah. 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 We did that. And uh, you know, uh, I don't know. Not the PA, if we brought the PA with us, but most of our gear, you know, yeah. stuff like that. PA was probably provided, but um, yeah, so we did that for 
four or five years I did that. And then I, I ended up being in the Bay Area in like 74. And I joined a, a band in the Bay Area, some friends that I knew. Um, yeah, and so, uh, and then I ended up settling there for about 20 years. Wow. Yeah. You know, and after that band, five years of that band, 1978, 79, I met the guys the Night Ranger uh, when they were still in Rubicon. Rubicon, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. They, so they were there. Um, and, the, and that was Jerry Martini from Sly Stone. That was Max Haskett from Cold Blood, uh, Johnny Cola from uh, Huey Lewis, Huey Lewis and the News. Right. And um, and uh, yeah, was, so we continued that. They had already made a couple of records. I joined the band as a touring drummer, singer. You know, they lost their drummer who was the lead vocalist in the band. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now we're talking about, we're talking about 78, 79. Then we decide to change the band up a little bit. We go and, um, you know, it's still Brad and Jack and I, and Jerry was still in the band. But then after a while, we, you know, we just, thought it wasn't working you know for maybe six months we played around san francisco and um didn't really have any gigs and couldn't get a record deal really we were making demos at the time new music so rubicon of, rubicon didn't have a label or a record deal well um they were on 20th century fox for two records and then when when i got in the band we couldn't really get a deal music okay. was changing it's going into the 80s at that point. Right. More rock and roll. You know, Pat Benatar was out, you know. Um, well, that, that band was, was a little more progressive, wasn't it? It was a horn band. So it was funk rock, yeah, more R&B. Wow. And so that was kind of like disco was like out. Right. And But we weren't disco, but it was mm. R&B. And it wasn't really, it was going into a new era at that point. And Tom Petty, you know, like I said, you know, Pat Benatar, you know. Um, you know, uh, who else was like, uh, God, you know, a lot of metal was starting to happen. Then. Yeah, the early metals. Well, and yeah, you're in the Bay, right? Metallica started to take off right then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so we were trying to, trying to, you know, trying to figure it out. We're trying to figure it out. We were still writing songs. And some of the songs ended up being, you know, uh, on the first record. We changed it up a little bit. We were, you know, really? like Eddie coming out tonight from the first record was was something we were playing at that time in 79. Um, Sister Christian was kind of, we were fooling around with it and um, it started to become a song. I don't know if we were really playing it, you know? Hold on, you, this is a good historical spot to stop. I gotta, yeah. I, I gotta do this really quick. Somebody wanted, to, he said, uh, he heard you wanted to say hi for uh, his birthday. So he was gonna pop in to say, hey. Oh, great. Yeah, let's see. Hey, buddy. Sorry I missed your birthday, man. There he is. Hey, buddy. How's it going? 21, eh? Yeah. Good Lord. Yeah, it's crazy. We're going to have to chain you up, man. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, please. All the chicks are all the chicks are going to come after you. We're going to have to, like, keep them, <laughs> keep them, keep them close now. He's quarantined, man. He can't talk to the, like, six foot apart. <laughs> oh, God. Well, they're starting to open up here a little bit, you know, bars and and people are being real defiant you know they're going out no mask right hanging out in the street you know just uh, you know we'll see what happens i guess they're gonna have you know a video like uh tracking you know like okay well, let's see if this guy gets sick in a week and then we'll <laughs> yeah. Like, uh... <laughs> yeah now that he now that he can go into those clubs and you know meet the ladies yeah he can't do it now so we'll hopefully it'll happen soon yeah definitely. But, uh, I, yeah. I heard because jack lives up there with you. hey man happy birthday to you Hope thank you, had you. A good I really appreciate it it's nice right. to meet, man. Yeah, well, you met. Yeah. We'll see you soon, man. Thanks, yeah, yeah. buddy. Uh, okay. Sorry about that, buddy. That, uh, no, that's all right. I'm glad you did that. No, that's... Um, all right. So you were saying it's, uh, Eddie, Eddie's coming out tonight. You didn't think Sister Christian had been written just yet, but... We, uh, we had written. We it, it was written, and we were just still trying to figure out because, you know, we were playing around. We didn't want to play ballads too much. Right. You know? We wanted to keep everything up, so it was like, Eddie's coming out tonight. Penny, I got your number. All right. Um, what else? There was a, a, a couple of the songs from the first album that we were actually playing. You know? Okay. And that's all stuff that you're singing. So. Demos and, you know, so some of the early demos had those songs on it. Um, we had Sing Me Away, I think, oh, was yeah. in there. We hadn't written Don't Tell Me You Love Me yet. 
hadn't written any of those, you know, uh, uh, you know, hit songs from the first. Time. Yeah. Um, Sing Me Away was in there, but I don't know, you know, it's it's kind of weird. You know, you you throw in songs and as you're growing as a band, you start to expand and certain things fall in, fall out, you know. Yeah. Do demos of certain songs and they don't sound so good. You toss them. You I remember the, the early the demo. The demos of those, yeah, like yeah, they, the, the demos, are still around, man. That's um, like Sister Christian was like the last time um, we were in the studio, we we brought up some of those demos to see if we could maybe use pieces of them because some of the songs were, you know, we loved them. So, but we wanted to uh, we wanted to see if we could still be, you know, go back and grab a kernel from something. But anyway, Sister Christian was so slow on some of those demos. We were like. Oh my God! Stop! Stop! Just, turn, oh, just turn it off! Just turn it off! It was like motor and oh. <laughs> and it was like, oh my God! It's horrifying. Which is it's probably awful. a good prom date song, right? It's a you know good prom dance tempo, but yeah, <laughs> but yeah, but oh, the, the fact God. that you still have those is cool because collectors are always going to want that, and you know you've got stuff for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, man. I don't know. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> but so what but, was the, what was the lineup at this point where you're changing? I mean, you hadn't changed the name yet. You're just like putting together demos out. So it's still Rubicon. So, so we were shopping it. Um, mm -hmm. and then um and playing gigs, we'd go to LA, do showcases, and we'd open for you know Gamma with you know, Ronnie Montrose and, wow. and uh you know met all those guys. Fitz, you know, was in that band early on oh, and then nice. he came with us, you know. Uh but yeah, but Fitz was playing keyboards with Sammy sometimes, and then he would play bass in the band Gamma. So he wow. did the first couple of albums with them. Okay. Interesting, a little tidbit. I think a lot of the fans know that, but um, as, as Ranger, we would go down to LA and play the country club down in LA, which is like the premier showcase place. But we never, we never really got, you know, anybody to, to, to bite, you know, on our demo. Until Pat Glasser, the, the producer that produced first three records, came to one of our shows and said, "I want to, I want to produce your, you know, a demo, and I want to bring it in the studio and make it sound like a record, because your demos really don't sound very good. You know, like eight track." You know? Yeah. And he wanted to bring us in. Get you were called Ranger at that point. We we're called Ranger at the All time. Right, okay. You know, and um, we we've been uh, we start telling this story this year when we were doing the double album shows the first okay. and second albums we would do back to back this last year we start telling this story about this about how um, pat glasser came uh and we were called ranger and that actually that name stuck for into the first record before its release okay we had there was ten thousand records they're out there somewhere and wow. anybody that's I, was sure like, I was sure like to see what it looked like, but it was, you know, the Rangers, you know, and um, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting story because um, what happened was um, there was somebody out there that had the name. Okay. And I think it was a country band. We think it was from the South. We thought it was from Nashville. We couldn't tell. It was like 20 years of country music in Billboard magazine, two weeks before we were Wow. ready to release the album and, and it was like oh my god what are we going to do we can't we can't we can't let this happen so they scrambled and started doing new artwork like well, what are you going to call yourselves and we had the song night ranger already on the album right you know so we never we didn't want it to be a theme song right you know yeah I, you know we got this theme song you know that's what night rangers all about. right oh my god no you know it was but we had to jump quick yeah and come up with a name and that was we just you know said hey you know let's just go with that so they came up with new artwork put a knight above ranger wow. took the the off oh really so and, the, uh, the rangers logo yeah, here's jen yay so the jen, jen's just piping in here Carl, hello mrs keegy how you doing i can't even oh, sit here oh Hi. my goodness i missed that smile <laughs> too close <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, the real, the real, the real us, right? That's it. Uh, so, 
for those of you just uh, just now joining, this is the beautiful better half of uh, Kelly. This is Jenna Tarkigi. Hi, buddy. Married in October, and this is a uh, this is their wedding pic right there. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Good memories. I told uh, I told Kelly that uh, they shouldn't go on stage unless Brad is only using these pics from now on. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I forgot to do when you guys were here last was take you to uh to Voodoo Donut, right? The the the, the legend. Oh, man. No. We, we got oh, one. We did. Oh, that's right. I okay, and then where the magic is in the hole, just uh, uh I, um, I, I love it. I, that I, was I, right, that was right before we got our car towed. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> I, that's right. That's right. We, wait, we, wait, that was right before the car was towed, but after the best dinner ever. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. So oh, yeah. yeah, we we went to the it was main, worth it. Every dog. I forgot. Yeah, we went. We went to the other Voodoo Donut where there's no line, yeah. and um, you guys got to experience Portland culture, all kinds mm -hmm. of it. The tow yards, and <laughs> <laughs> that was my mistake. It was like uh, it was so dumb because it was it was chained off, you know, and it had a yeah. sign there. We were like, oh no, you know, there's nobody here. Let's just go do it, right? Yeah. And it was like we come out an hour later, and the car is gone. You know, but we like, had the best Lebanese food ever. That oh, really, I'm glad you loved it because I, I it's my favorite. Nikolai's for you guys are asking at home that uh, um, yeah, go to Nikolai's but park on Grand. Do not park in the parking <laughs> lot next door. <laughs> on the street. That's right. right. Yeah. Or order out. Oh, you know what? Look, I got another sponsorship here. Where else did we go? Yeah. Oh, we yeah. Music oh, yes. oh man. The record store. That was yeah. awesome. that place. I'll be talking. Yeah. You guys got to meet Terry Courier. Like he's the mm -hmm. pioneer of the record store community. And we'll be talking to him next week, actually, on this uh, conversation. It's very whatever, nice. Whatever this thing is, you know. But um, I, uh, you know, Jen, we, uh, this is horrible, but I kind of went into interview mode where we were talking to Kelly about early days of high school and traveling to LA and you know the typical questions he's got to be asked but I had all sorts of friends of of his that were wanting to say like you know please give my best like Terry Finley Kelly Terry Finley and I were just talking and he said uh, awesome. please you know, I, I guess he reminds me of your twin you guys have so much like similar personality and have you <laughs> Jen, Jen have I you gotten to meet him yet I don't think I've met have I met Terry no I don't, I don't think, think you so. have okay next time you yeah. come up we got to go out because Terry has this beautiful farm up in the gorge out, uh, and uh it's out towards oh. multnomah falls and it's up um it's boy, it overlooks the columbia gorge but he's got goats and he's got chickens and oh, and uh, it's like a so he does on facebook he does the daily goat that he shares a little video like feeding his goats <laughs> are they screaming goats is what they're I not want. no i want i want yeah, i want the fainting goats you know the ones that pass out <laughs> when you, were, yeah oh really <laughs> those are funny yeah <laughs> those. but yeah. But you've got a lot of well, fans. Very good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna step out. I just got I got groceries on the counter, but I want to oh. say hi. I'm really glad miss to see you. you. I miss, miss you too. Hey, get, hey, let's get, get rid of the pandemic so we can all hang out again. All right? Yeah. Absolutely. I'm working on it. Come okay. Up with a, uh, Thank you. A shot. Yeah. Do. Yeah. Jen, that's Jen's Jen's uh, task list for the day. Get rid of the pandemic. Make sure that we get together. Yes, that's right. Get on that right away. That's right. Let me shut the door. Hold on. You bet. All right. I wanted to pause. Like since we're all, we are pausing. I know everybody is so worried about uh, big sports not coming back. Okay. And I found a team that's going to take over for the big sports teams. Oh, look this at this. Not, we better go close to the camera. At a, if you can get a good shot of that. Get in there close. Oh, look at that. Look at it. They're called the Pistols. Oh, man. From yeah. 19... 1911, I think it says 1911 down here. Which uh, and that look was at this. The, that was and the, the last... guy got it. Is like carrying a gun. Right oh, god. oh god! The pistols, man. Well, it's you like, know what? That was hey, the last. Man, if the umpire <laughs> umpire says you're out, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Out. Yeah, change that. That this is you know that was the last pandemic we had was about that time too. You know? I know. So so you can see that sports is still you know came about after that so. Look at these characters, man. Aren't they great? So I just wanted to let you know that they're going to take over. Okay. And they'll, they'll be touring America. This is, uh, yeah, that's, uh, well, you know, if we have competitive sports, international competitive sports, then we'll see, you know, who the pistols play when we go to we, Europe. And yeah, we'll get them going with it, like, you know, uh, the Englishmen or uh, the right? Italians. Yeah, these guys be, look like Italians, actually. <laughs> they, they, they do. They do. <laughs> they, well, I know what a sports fan you are. They, they, you played oh, baseball, man. didn't you, when you were younger? 
I did. I played ball in uh, in high school. I was, just didn't have that. You know, it was like I I was missing that heart. Yeah. That that of course with music you could totally go all in. Yeah. Heart and soul, and 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 ball players can too. But I didn't. I didn't really. You know, I I I was a great hitter, but I was afraid yeah. at the at the plate. I was afraid. That's how I. You know, it was like I used fear to get on base. It was like. This guy's throwing an 80 mile an hour fastball. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think you found so, your calling, man. You know, you, oh, you found, man. You I, I think I did anyway. But um, so, all right, well, let's go back to so, it. Yeah. So, so Night, 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 Night Ranger, you formed the band, uh, the name out of necessity quickly. Yep. Got the logo, yep. got the artwork. Uh, Record gets um, released. Yeah, gets released. And, and, uh, we get uh, we get a favor of, of Kiss put us on their 10th anniversary tour, wow. which was, there was a connect with our uh, record guy to them. He used to work at Casablanca, and that was their one of their big bands. And uh, so he was the vice president. Uh, uh, Bruce Bird was his name. Okay. And uh, so he went to Boardwalk Records, which was Joan Jett's record, our right. record, record label. So they asked Kiss for a favor. We got on that tour. It was probably about maybe 25 dates we did, I believe. And um, it was on the um, Creatures of the Night record. Oh, Eric which is uh, I Love It Loud. You know, know. My, my favorite Kiss record. Yeah, one, one of my favorite too. And, and just every one of those songs, you know, was, oh. was near and dear to my heart because they oh. were playing a lot of it. Keep them coming. Of them. Rock, oh. rock and Roll Hell. Oh my God! Yeah. Great, so great. so you, you hung with Eric Carr during his like mm -hmm. the beginning of his tenure. Was he oh, as yeah. kind and sweet as I expect? Oh, um, absolutely! Everything yeah. you've heard about him, he was just a, a gentleman, a really nice, very personable, you know, and just I, you know, and and complimentary, you know. Um, all of them were, you know, uh, we were just these young, you know, rookies out there going, Oh boy, we're going on tour. You know? Yeah. Well, and, he was then too. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, What's he was, that? he was brand new in the band too. So he probably yeah. had the same spirit that you did about that point. Right. Exactly. He was like, very, and, and Vinnie Vincent was in the band Oh wow! at the time. And, and, uh, so there was a little tension there in the beginning of right. the tour because they were trying to break him in and, you know, and Carr was, you know, he was he was already a veteran for them, and, he, and you know, it's like he's sitting on that drum turret, right? Right, the, the tank, the tank. You know, <laughs> it was it was, I. You know, when, when the first day we showed up, I was like, oh my god, I gotta I gotta go watch him set up. You know, first day, and we walked over. It was a ice arena up in the, uh, upstate New York where we started the tour, and and I just remember. Um, all the all the roadies knew that we were a rookie that we had hadn't hadn't toured or anything so we we're watching these guys set up and they're like you know they're like i'll oh, watch this you know and they're setting off this you know bombs you know the right. the uh it's like a carburetor type of uh explosion device that you could fire it you know a bunch of times and it wasn't uh, pyrotechnics but they had all that too but yeah but they kept firing this thing off it's testing it, right? scaring the shit out of us yeah now. it was like and they'd wait for us to get close you know oh no just and then, to mess with and like, and like, ah! oh, and, get... and uh, the guy that was setting up all the pyro you know they had his room all roped off you know do not enter you know expl explosives high explosives and and he peeks out and goes hey oh god you know with this wild look on and say hey want to come in i got a new thing i want we're like ah you know? the and mad professor the roadies are picking up like svt amp heads you know they're empty but we didn't know and they're oh. like they're like <laughs> you know and all those kind of stuff that we were we were like freaking out about but, but yeah. it was a dummy it cabinets. was a great place to start man wait a minute great so they place had to start, dummy man. cabinets and a real in a fake tank it wasn't real oh <laughs> my god awesome yeah so <laughs> what what a way to jump in man first tour with kiss 25 oh, I, I know and the thing was too is that they, you know, Big John was their tour manager who did most of the announcing. You wanted the best. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it was the crowd, oh, you wanted the best, you know, and it's just like booming. But he brought, he came into our dressing room on the first night and he said, ah, so um, 
so you guys uh, never never played to this audience, right? And we're like, we're like, uh, now you know, you, you know, maybe give us some tips. And he goes, yeah, he goes, he goes, just don't stop, don't stop moving, just keep moving. He said, but because shit's going to be flying at you. Oh no! He said, oh my god, shit will be flying at you. He said, but don't stop moving. Don't worry about it. Just keep moving. Everything will be what fine. What about we'll you? See if you get hit, you can't go anywhere. Yeah, we'll take care of you and make sure everything. And <laughs> one of the things that happened was, you know, when we um, at the end of "Don't Tell Me You Love Me," we do that break where the keyboard goes, da, 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 right? And they all fall to the ground, right? That that's how we developed all that stuff. Is you know, through playing, we had these moves, right? And the life would go, yeah. boom, and it would, they'd be in the spotlight. The three of them, like all in a big pile. A target. And the first night, totally. The first night, there was this hunk of metal oh that somebody God. went to, to to metal shop and and welded nails and metal and all this stuff. And it 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 went <clears throat> right next to somebody in the spotlight. Oh my god. And nobody saw it except for maybe the few people in the front. But that was like our initiation. Wow. The kiss audience like da 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 oh, da 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 all of a sudden you hear this big oh boom, man big stump and it, it was a big hunk of metal with nails and screws and <laughs> I, hopefully you guys kept that that's a good souvenir for your first I don't tour, know what you know? happened to it I know I know I think somebody just ran out and got it and just took it and threw it away that that would have been like yeah our first night in kiss this is oh. what they threw up on stage that was the very first night oh my very god first night. Were you setting up on the side of the stage at that point? Orders, you know. Were you setting up side side stage? Yeah, side stage. So from beginning, you've always set up on the side of the stage, and well, we always did that because we wanted to to be able to have some sort of show. Yeah. Instead of me being back there, and the platform takes all the room, and the keyboard, we had a keyboard player too, and so it was like, oh my god, so. That was that was our initiation, God. but but you know everything went great. I mean, I'd throw stuff up on stage, but Kiss audiences are, you know, now it's not it's not like that at all. But yeah, maybe maybe Metallica, right? Maybe maybe there's still some of that stuff going on, but hey, you know, it's all part of it. You know, you just deal with it and move on. Yeah. Well, let me ask you. Well, I mean, Kiss was still using Big John forever, you know, like on those intros. But you had other Kiss connections over the years. I know that Doc McGee was managing you guys for a while, and right during his Kiss tenure as well, right? Right. Well, um, this this was before that. Yeah, yeah, we went with Doc about maybe I think it was about eighteen years ago. Oh, okay. All right. We went so- with Doc, and then uh, and then now it's James Blades was working for Doc at the time. This is okay. Jack's son. And then he, when he split off from Doc, or he just decided to 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 go, um, you know, we he's been our manager, you know, ever since then. So right on. Yeah, he's been with us for a good long while, you know. That's, he's doing a great job too. That's Amazing. Nice to keep it in the family, you know. Yep, yep, in the family. He he grew up with us. He would be out on stage sleeping on cases while we'd be playing. You know. Wow. That's so those kids grew up being on the road with yeah. us. You know. And playing with everybody and traveling and all that. So it's pretty you, great. You have an extended family. When you go out with you guys and you, the whole pre gig situation that you have where you're all gathering and doing the warm up and you do the toasts, you know, and, but it's neat because yep. there's an extended family, especially up in the Northwest. Jack's got all his family up there. And it's pretty amazing oh, yeah. to see just, uh, you know, it's like, um, like a big wedding gathering almost. You see a bunch of family there and you just happen it's to be totally walk, right. walking on stage right after. Yeah, I mean, we we like to keep it like that, and I think a lot of bands do that because, you know, you're this just big group that's traveling together out there, and we gotta, you know, we gotta have those routines that keep everybody real close. Yeah. And 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 you know, keep everybody in the full. And so that's what that's about. We love doing that, and um, so, I, you know, hopefully we'll I, get I, back I, to it one of these days. I, I think that stuff carries through to the to the fans too, because you've got a rabid fan base you know like some real serious followers that have followed you guys i mean i know japan you guys are huge in the states you've got people that you know night ranger tattoos everywhere and they've done you know they've they've traveled overseas to see you do the double album shows and yeah i, I would too if i you know i just got to get my airline sponsorship but um, yeah. <laughs> yeah 
but hey, uh, we're but, really lucky, man. We've been around for 36 years. I mean, it's you it, know, and the three of us have been together. So, you know, we played in two other bands, right. you know, and then before Night Ranger, and and I don't know, you know, Brad was a huge star before we started this band. So it was great that he came into this with, you know, he brought all of those fans from the Aussie days that he, he was on tour with Aussie for the eight months. Okay, yeah, I was gonna ask. Because of the devil. I, so, I just, um, just watch that live, yeah. that live show, man. It's amazing to watch him. What a tough gig to fill in from, you know, Randy Rhodes passes on, you gotta go out there and replace yeah. like, the biggest guitarist in the world at that point, right? So. No kidding. But he owned it. And we, we've gone to see Ozzy when he first uh, came out uh, at the day of day in the green in Oakland. Um, I can't remember what year that he first came out with it. And Randy, and I remember we were backstage watching and we thought, we thought because Randy was like a tiny little guy. Yeah. And from the back, he looked like a, a lady. Oh, right? yeah. And we were like watching him. And we were like, we're like, oh my God, he's got a he's got a chick playing guitar. Man, this is great. She's hot. unbelievable. You know? <laughs> you know, but um, but yeah, Randy. Oh my God, I mean, he sounded so good that first those first shows, you know, that he played playing, playing in front of eighty thousand people. Yeah, that must have yeah. been. He was just a kid too, so right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know? but but Brad, you know, what a remarkable thing! Like Brad gets the call to come in and fill in. You know, I've seen that whole yeah. story, but it's a tough gig to have to roll into that. And uh, but was he taken? And so, and he had been quite right before that, right? So he already had wasn't. Um, he, well, Rudy, Rudy was um, was it wasn't Rudy in Quiet Ride before? He, he was. I thought yeah. Brad had done something with Quiet Ride as well. I can no, wrong. okay. No, he had been, he had he had been with us the whole time. Okay. And, um, you know, we were just struggling, trying to get a ba band together. Brad and I were playing in a cover band uh, on the weekends while we were trying to get a deal. Yeah. So it was Brad and I were playing together um, over in Oakland in these little little dives and having a great time with Danny Chauncey um, was a guitar player from 38 Special. Okay. And he was in the band with us. So we were all struggling musicians trying to make things happen. And, and, um, and he got the call from Pat Thrall. Okay. Pat Thrall was, in a, an Alameda guy too. Okay. And so was Brad. And and so Pat called him up and said, look, you know, I, I got this thing with Travers. I can't I can't do it, but you know, they're looking for a guitar player right now. They're kind of dead in the water in the middle of this tour and we're trying to get somebody to fit. So he went back there. Um Brad did after we played our gig on Saturday night in, in Alameda, he got on a plane and went back there and auditioned for Ozzy. Uh, in a hotel room with no amp. Oh my God. Like Ozzy was on the floor <laughs> and Brad was sitting on the bed going, you know, he's playing his strat with no, not even plugged into an amp or anything. He's like, I, you know, I know how to play, you know, flying high again, you know, and, and I know how to play this and that. And Ozzy's like sitting on the floor, like, like going like this. He's like, <laughs> and Brad's like, <laughs> oh my God. I know what got in the gig. But it was no amp, right? I know what got in the gig. Because like, he's playing all this, all the licks and playing everything. And he's like listening to him. It's like, oh, oh, oh sorry. And, and then he goes out and opens it, you know, the, the, you know on the second floor and there's in this big suite. And he announces to everybody, I found our guitar player. And oh my God. Going, what, what do you, what do you, what do you, oh, okay, yes. we start tomorrow. You start rehearsing with us and we, have you know we have a, wow. a guitar player playing it and we start working him in God. on a few songs and as they go down the road they pretty soon he's playing 10 songs and he's playing and then pretty soon yeah they get guitar play was done but wow. that's a tr true story that, that Brad told about on the sitting hotel. on the bed and ozzy on the floor with no amp i know what got brad the gig because no i know what got him the gig it was his facial expressions because yeah he, <laughs> Brad has the most expressive what uh, my uh, my ex girlfriend used to refer to as sex face, right? So like you can always tell what what a musician looks like in the sack when you watch them on stage, and so that's right. I, I wonder if I could find a picture of Brad's sex face online. I know uh, our Brad, Brad's biggest fan, Colleen, is uh, watching right now, and I know she, oh, cool. she, she has a good handful of uh, Brad's sex faces that she took on her own. But let's see. Uh, um, 
You know what? We didn't have to make this all about Brad and his sex face. No, no, I'd love to. But, I'd uh, love to. I'd like to make it about everybody else and take all the heat off of me. No, no. Okay, well, okay. Where's where's a good one here? Let me. Uh, we have to get a really. Yeah, I guess it doesn't work just in photos too, because you really have to get the whole video thing. He's got. Uh, yeah. Got, like like the creepy tongue thing in going on in <laughs> the whammy bar. Yeah. But uh, yeah, most of the pictures I find on Google. Search Right now look very um distinguished and uh you know but uh oh here's his uh i think this is his playgirl shot this is um <laughs> this oh how funny he's gonna love this yeah here let's see yeah doesn't that look like his playgirl shot right there? yeah that's right yeah what a hunk oh my goodness <laughs> okay brad you got enough of the real estate time the um uh but so brad yeah it's his, uh, his aussie story and um at this so, point, so when you're, well, I was going to ask you about that tour. You did the Kiss tour. You did the Kiss felt, thing. Did you do enough of a gather enough of a fan base to really feel like you had an audience that you could do? Well, the the uh, Don't Tell Me You Love Me the first single was starting to starting to take off and doing really well, and so we just jumped from the Kiss thing to to uh, I believe to Sammy Hagar. Um, three Lock Box. We did Three oh, Lock yeah. Box with him. I'm not sure if that was the same year, but I know that, yes. That sounds right. Because we came back and the last two shows were at the Cow Palace in San Francisco. My homecoming. So, and we were like, oh my God, we're coming off of this great success. It's blowing up on radio. Records are selling really well. And we get back and we get a call from the gentleman I was talking about, Bruce Bird, who was our record guy. And he goes, I got to come up to these shows. I got, I got some news for you. And we thought it was going to be like, yes, our record's going to, you know, it was selling well. And he said, record's doing great. He said, but Boardwalk is bankrupt and they're going under. And that the IRS came and closed the offices oh, no. and are looking to get paid. And uh, everybody, they closed the offices, distribution stopped, you know, um, so we, we, we were out of a label. We had no label. We were dead in the water. I and mean, we were like, we we're come off of this really successful radio thing and, and still playing. And we're like, oh my God, how can we like keep this momentum going? We had basically two weeks to yeah. gather up after, after doing all that touring and gone for months and months, coming back. And he's like, you need to get back in the studio. You need to make another record. We're going we're gonna to see who we, you know, uh, who we can get, who would who, who would get on board with this and get you signed. And Irving Azoff had just taken over MCA Records. Okay. And they were good friends, um, Bruce and him, or fairly good friends, I guess. And so they went over and made a deal, guaranteed the first record, which was like, we thought that was it. That was amazing. Um, they worked out some sort of point thing and here and our, so our next record was going to be on MC Camel MCA. So he, Bruce started a label, okay. small label. He was in the process of doing it anyway. He was going to move us over there. And then we got MCA, which was at the time the biggest record company at the time. Yeah. Um, and so we got in there. We had some songs left over. We had Sister Christian, which we didn't put on the first record. Um, left over, went and worked that one out, started writing, got back in there. Probably within a month, we were back in there with Pat Glass, the producer. Start went back to the same studio, Alan Zen Studio, um, and started to work on it. Back then, too, you know, we had a comp deal, some sort of comp deal in the studio. It wasn't a, it wasn't like a real commercial facility. And so we could spend time in the studio working on stuff and not oh. have to. So we went in the back room where we were going to record drums, a huge room. We rehearsed back there in the daytime while the studio up front was doing whatever they did, you know, mastering and doing all these other things and mixing. And we were back rehearsing. And then after six, we could record because the other, uh, uh, you know, the other you know, whatever was there, 
uh, next door neighbors or had different businesses and photography and all this stuff going on. So we couldn't make noise. So after everybody left, we could set up the mics and record, you know. So we worked on the second album that way for about a month and just cranked and cranked and, you know, wrote songs and just kept going with it. And we were so lucky that our creativity was flowing. Big time. time, especially, you know, you could feel like since the rug got pulled out from underneath you that you might lose a little bit of that. Yeah. Uh, or, and when Bruce um, dialed up this label and you had that partnership, then did you have enough funding that you really didn't have to worry about being able to pay a bill to, I mean, obviously the studio had a comp deal, but are you guys, oh, sure. are, are you living on oh, sure. ramen or are you doing okay by this point? I, I was still driving my, my, seven, my, my 70 Maverick. Where are you? Oh my faded God. Yellow and, you know, but at that point there was money flowing because okay. there were records selling, even though, you know, they had closed that label. We still had the, you know, the, the, the royalty streams were coming in slowly. And we, you know, um, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's eight, nine months behind, yeah. but we had done all that touring. So we had a little bit of money from touring, not much, but, um, yeah, the funding came in right away to make Good. the record. Okay. And then they wanted videos and of course all that stuff started coming in. And, you yeah. know, you make it for free. Well, MT know. MTV, it's just starting to pop right then, right? Just so, starting to so. pop. So don't tell me you love me was yeah. probably only one of 10 or 15 videos that they actually had. That's right. That's you know, so that thing was like in heavy rotation. Boom, boom. You sing guys, me away. We've made we've made sing sing me away. So that was waiting there okay we had another single that never got uh put out uh but they had you know pumped them out but they never they never came out um and so we moved on we were working you know just feverishly to try and get you know the recordings and the mixing and all that stuff and get on another tour yeah you know so we got on zz top when that when the second record came out and zz top was doing small theaters they had been away for a while and they jumped to arenas and we got on that. My first so concert. Like the Eliminator. My first tour. concert. Was it? It was. Oh, Great, it was Great Falls, Montana. Oh, yep. Amazing. I'll never forget it, man. And Jack actually fell off the front of the stage because somebody, <laughs> kicked the, he was kicking a beach ball and he ran up to kick the beach ball and had a little too much momentum and went right down in front of the barricade. So buddy got right back up and kept rocking. If, so. you, if you know how many times he actually has fallen off the stage. Really? It would, you, you'd be like, how come he's like not in the hospital with yeah. a broken neck? You know? But it would be like, there would be enough guys there that were paying attention. These big guys would catch him or break his fall. Or whatever. He, he was, it just, I mean, he it could was, just say, I'm stage diving, man. It's cool. I meant to, yeah. meant to do that. <laughs> But it was always like when we'd come off at the intro, oh, right? Because yeah. we'd jump off the, the uh, back line and run up front and it'd be like, ah! <laughs> Oh, God. Here but, you go. But, <laughs> but that's a big deal because it's easy top just slammed the Eliminator oh, record. Yeah. They, they were doing big shows. And so, and you, yeah. you, honestly, every show that I've seen you on, when you've got a co-bill with other bands from back then all the way to today, no band wants to go on after you. That's one thing. And I don't know if it's an intentional competitive thing. It doesn't seem like that's the attitude, but there's so much energy at a Night Ranger show to this day, 2020. Night Ranger has as much energy on stage as they've had in 1983. And so you know what? We, yeah, we don't want we don't want anybody to think that we're just up there, you know, walking through it. And we just figure out, figure out if it's it's gonna be one of those, one of those things where like if you if you're not able to do it, then we should quit. Yeah. You know. I mean, so if we try and keep our, our energy level as high as possible, I think yeah. that's what our music is too. Yeah. Our music, it's, it's pretty, pretty easy to, to listen to Night Ranger and know, you know, that you're going to get some kick-ass rock and roll. Yeah. Good, yeah. good pop songs too. But, yeah, so you know. many songs. People have no idea. I mean, the fans know. But if somebody says, oh, yeah, I know Sister Christian. I know you can still rock in America. And then they go see a show and they realize that you guys could do three hours nonstop and every one of those songs is a hit. You know, it's, it's a really, it's a rare, like, um, I guess. We're so lucky, man. Well, We're you so know what? We have, I, we have I talk great to people writers, about Jack Blades. I mean, is that, what, is a, that, what that's an not incredible luck? writer. We all work to, so well together. And, you know, I, it's all about that. That's not luck. Writer. 
that's not luck in my mind, right? I mean, there's fortune that you guys have, but in your guys' position, the talent's all there. You've got respect for each other. You know, I think the luck comes from other things, man. But, you know, I, I talk yeah. to people quite a bit about luck. I think so much luck is what you make of it. And you guys put yourself, you assembled a band that had that collective unity in, in writing, but it's a special thing. You know, it's just, there's magic. Maybe that's what it is. It's magic and not luck, I think. But, but you're you know, right. It's, it's the vibe. It's whatever electricity, whatever happens, it flows through all of us and yeah. keeps us all together like that. Like talking about this whole pandemic thing. It's like, you know, uh, you were saying like in the beginning of the uh, 19, eight, uh, eight, nine, uh, 20th century, when they had that pandemic, mm -hmm. I mean, they couldn't, we couldn't have, you know, gotten by right. if we didn't have stuff in place, that energy, that electricity, the, you know, the brotherhood. I mean, you know, we got it in takes America. We got it in America. Takes and community for sure. It, absolutely. Yeah. And I think... That's what bands have. Yeah. They click well. Right. You know? So that we, we just happen to, to to catch that. You know, we yeah. have it. You know? That's that's no, thanks for that. I appreciate well, that. Well, no, man, it's that's uh the reason I love doing these things with my friends is to acknowledge that kind of stuff. You know, there are I, I'm grateful when I see my buddies that are not mailing it in, you know, and I love the, our band touring this last year, we finally got to a point where we were gelling. We toured a bunch. And I remember walking out there feeling that energy, the goosebump thing again, that you miss, you know, for like so long, who knows when it will happen again, but there's nothing better than that feeling when everybody on stage is feeling it. Cause then everybody in the crowd vibes off it. And it's like this synergistic thing that you can't describe. Yep. Nobody can describe it. It just, it's a rare thing when it happens, you don't want to lose it, but so you're having that happen right there. You got the, uh, um, you know, the Madness record come out and just like you got, like was Sister Christian yeah. the first single or was it you can or was it uh, do you get no the first single was uh, you can start and still rock in America okay, and I think we um, you know back then too radio would play deeper tracks right and, you know like it was it was rolling so they would they would just roll the tracks which we. We had three or four songs off that record playing it. Just rumors in the air. Oh yeah, you know, um, you, you know that that rock in America. Um, they were trying to break a single. They were trying to get a single to stick, and Sister Christian was thrown. Was, you know, we went to the ballad. I mean, you always kind of go to the ballad, right? When you when you feel like, well, let's let's see, what, you know, if we can actually get a hit to cross over to. Yeah, the format, you know. Did you, and, um, did you know? I mean, you you had the, written the song so far before, but did you know yeah. this is kind of this is kind of our ace in the ace in the hand that we didn't. You we didn't. Do, you know you never do you never do you just you know you're just hoping that you know you know you got a good track and you know there's emotion attached to it. And when you listen to that song, you you know you still feel I still feel it too. Yeah. You know, do you? I mean, it, and there's something about those piano ballads that start. And if they're not lovey-dovey, like, you know, uh, too much about that, but yeah. they have a, some another message, then you can grab people. And I think that that's what, that's what that song did, you know. Well, can, um, can you talk we about very, the, the message of that? You want to talk about what? what well, it was, it, it was definitely about my sister and my big brother kind of vibe. You know, it's like my big brother cares about me and, you know, that, that kind of thing. And he's looking out for me. And that's what it was. I wanted to portray that. And, and uh, so I went up to visit her one time and I saw her coming of age. And that's what it was, was basically a song about her being old enough to, to be with boys and her older brother was standing back there going, hey, yeah, like it, you know. So that's what it was, a that's little great. message to her. Yeah. Nice, okay. Right, so you, they, they release it, they use that, that's their sort of, uh, here's the carrot that we're gonna dangle to make this record pop. Yeah, uh, but you, just, we're not, yeah. you, weren't, you weren't touring at this point. This is just the record. We were. Okay, we were we were on tour at the time. Um, I'm not sure if we did more dates. With, we did a bunch of dates with with uh, ZZ. We jumped uh, from there to um, 38 special. Okay, and they were they were just blowing up the charts right. too. Yeah. So um, we got on that thing. That was about a three and a half month jump. Um, I can't remember what else after that, but I think that that took us through that record 
Is and this primarily um, U.S. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, no. Actually, um, every record we would we would start in Japan. Everyone we would go over to Japan. They okay. definitely wanted us first. Yeah. So we'd go there and play. Um, played, you know, six or eight dates. You know, just yeah. like we do now. And um, yeah, man, it was like come back from that, jump on a tour here, keep rolling all the way through the summer into the fall. You know, and, and by then. Madness was just, you know, sold a million, a million and a half. It was just about to do double platinum and it was just blowing up. And we were like, oh my God, this is amazing. In between, you know, like uh, dates, you maybe have 10 days off in between, make videos. Yeah. You know, so we did When You Close Your Eyes. Oh, yeah. You still rock in America, Sister Christian. So those three were, were the ones for that album. And then we were just like, okay, we got to keep it going. We were paranoid then. It's like, oh my God, you never know if the record company is going to fail again. We yeah. Get another record. Did you, was your management so, kind of pushing that, saying, hey, man, don't let up? This is something you guys sure, do. Okay. Sure. Yeah. You know, so we came back, Seven Wishes is the third record. Came right back and we had Goodbye off of that. We had, um, um, God, what else? Just, you know, Seven Wishes, the song. Yeah. Should... We, we didn't make a video for that, but we made, uh, four in the morning. Yeah, and then you, you, know. had, you started getting soundtrack stuff happening then. Soundtrack came, came at the next. Oh, you know, Secret, and, Secret and of My Success. Actually on, the, on that too. It was uh, Interstate Love Affair. Was oh, a, yeah. On our, our Chevy Chase. Right. Uh, you know, um, Vacation was right. in there. Uh, Teachers was another. That's right. There. That's yeah, right. We got oh, there yeah. on that one. 38 was on there. They got Teachers on that one. Yeah. We got one. Um, yeah, kind of a, in the background. You know, talking about soundtracks too, we got asked to come in to, with a bunch of other artists to watch um, for Secret of My Success, which was the fourth record. Right. And um, so we got asked to come in and do that, you know, with Stevie Wonder, Joe Walsh, wow. um, Glenn Fry. Um, At a premiere? A in a, in a uh, little little uh, viewing room okay. at Warner Brothers, right? Okay. It was like Stevie Wonder was up front and then we were here. Glenn Fry came in with Joe Walsh. God, this is a horrible thing to make a joke about, but why put Stevie up front? Well, he can't, I mean, he can't see the yeah. screen. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's awful. I'm sorry, no, Stevie. Just, I'm sorry. No, I'm sure he's laughing about that too. <laughs> but he was, he was sitting in front of us. That's what I meant by up front. He was sitting okay. in front of us. Okay. <laughs> you know, Glenn Fry came in and and he's wearing a long coat. It's July, you know. We Glenn got Fry. this break. He's wearing this long coat. We're like, who's wearing it? It's like a, it's like 95 degrees out in LA. You know, like, what are you doing with this coat on? And him and Joe Walsh are both wearing these long coats, right? We're like, oh, oh. man, how are you doing? We're meeting him. So the lights go down. They start to, and they had yeah. these you know long pockets with beers oh in. god the cold beers in both sides and they <laughs> the lights go down and they go start nudging and pass it down pass it down so there's beers going up the they were the original you know, movie movie pros you know when yeah, you walk, exactly. you walk in the movie and stick your own yeah, candy yeah. in it's like do we have to do this well if we do let's let's bring it along a little little beverage to that so they they uh they hooked one up for you Passed them down. Yeah, God, you heard like, you no, know, before the sound says you. Yeah, <laughs> that's just pass it down. Pass it down. Cans rolling through the whole movie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that record so, took off. I mean, that was the huge. You know, Michael Box was at his biggest point, right? And the, the song, the theme song, that's a really unique theme song. Yeah. There's actually some really cool intricate parts in that song. Was that one that you wrote? Well, um, Jack, Jack got asked to come down, and David Foster was doing the soundtrack. Okay. So they put um, Foster had this keyboard thing, which is the intro to a secret, <laughs> and he had all that stuff together, right? But it was just a loop. It was that thing, right? Yeah. That's how the thing started. So that's how um, Jack was introduced to, you know, hey, come down. I got this idea. You know, I got a couple of guys we're going to put together. So Jack actually uh, wrote the lyric okay. to over over this piece of music he had. And when they when they when we went to record that, 
all they had was that loop. They didn't have anything else other than that. Okay. And, you know, and they sat down at the piano and they wrote the song. But when we went to record it to start the track, there was no track. All it was is we're going to play to this loop. And uh, here's the, here's the song on acoustic guitar and piano. Right. Wow. We're going to record this loop for seven minutes and you're going to play to that. So it was, you know. Yeah. Well, when I came in to recut the drums, here's David Foster holding the tape reel with like a broom handle. And he's holding to the, the piece of music that he had cut out that was, you know, like a eight bar thing yeah. or a 16 bar thing was that loop. And the engineer recording it onto another uh, machine for five or six minutes. Okay. So it's like, dee, 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 dee. And they're holding the reels going back and forth. And, back. and then it's going, oh you know, God. the output of that is going to a 24 track machine. And I, I walk in in the middle of it, is they're holding the reel. And I'm like, I'm like, what are you guys doing? Like, Shh. They're yeah. holding it, <laughs> trying to keep it steady. And, you know, and for five minutes, right? And wow. they do this piece of loop. And then they finally get it looped on to, so we cut to that. No kidding. And we started to put the song together while they were doing that. We were putting this song together, but I had walked in before anybody got there watching them do that. Yeah, that's the brick. That's how they did it the olden days, kids. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, that's that, right. right. You know, but that song is so full of really cool syncopated punches. You know, you've got the, oh. you know, a couple of time signature time changes right there. And, and it's like, you know, for a great pop song, that's one of those songs that you don't recognize that there are some really technical things happening because the song flows so well and it feels great. Okay. You know, and, but uh, Foster you, played all the keyboards on there too. Okay. So he was, played that bass. The oh bass really? Part, I love that. I said, "Oh man, this is going to be so easy to play to because all I have to play is yeah, <laughs> right. I don't have to play anything syncopated except da da da. You know, some yeah, of those those changes are there. cool though. Da 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 da. Yeah, you know? yeah. I just have to play a stomp and one uh, uh, and just keep it rolling while he played all the. All the, and I didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, you know, I didn't even have to punch those if I didn't want to, you know. Um, so that was that was fun. Um, I walked in there with my little black beauty. Oh, nice! Yeah, that was your snare at the time. Still, you still play a black no, beauty. just for that, just for that session. Okay, it wasn't mine actually. It actually wasn't mine. It was the studios. Okay, and I I found it where the head was broken, and I said I want to use that. Yeah, I want to use that. I I have other drums, but I want to use that, and I play played the track on that it's great what, what drums were you playing at that point um let me see that um i was on dw at that point we're already okay yeah early early dw drums yeah you were one, um, of, the, one of the early I guys pearl for the first two albums okay and then after that i i think i had i'm not sure though boy it's getting fuzzy well uh, it could have been still still been pearl You've had a lot of flight, flights between then and now, you know? Yeah. You can blame, you know, any, brain blame anything on coronavirus oh. at this point, man. So, That's you know, right. but, uh, uh, speaking of brain cells, you cool to talk about a little bit of like uh, that phase? I mean, you're going through the rock and roll phase in the 80s, and this is the area yeah. of excess. You, uh, you, uh, you were known to partake a little bit, right? You and the band. Oh, sure, man. It was everywhere. Co yeah. Cocaine was everywhere. Yeah. You know, and, and it was just like the drug, the drug of its time, yeah. you know, seventies and eighties were, you know, that's where everybody did that and everybody had it and everybody was socializing and everybody did that got it. Can you imagine now? No. How many, well, how many viruses you would get from sharing oh, a, a straw or a, right. a spoon or you know, but yeah, we all did it, and you know, and, and I had my bouts with it. I de I definitely yeah. had, you know, after I came back from that third tour, man, I was like in trouble. Yeah, money is you good. Know, I need travel in the world. You're like feeling like invincible. You're a rock star, right? And then, yeah, 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 and it never ends. And you like that tour. That third tour was an 18 month tour. Oh yeah, it never ended. Oh, it never yeah. ended. Went all over the world, everywhere. You know. And it was like, when I came home, I was like, I was like, you know, addicted. Yeah. I was like, you know, I couldn't settle down. You know? yeah. When you're doing that same thing over and over and over again sure. for months, months at a time, 
it's just that's what it is. It's yeah. what you do. You know. Were you concerned about your use? Was that? Were you concerned about your use at that time? I was. Yeah. When I got when I came home from that tour, I was really I was I was like I need somebody to help me out with this. Yeah. <clears throat> and there was a uh, I ran into a couple of uh, people that were you know going through the same thing. People were starting to, in '86. People were starting to go. I don't know about this anymore. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. The, the I'm just mentally addicted. You know. Right, it's like right, yeah right. right sure. All the junk they put in that stuff. Give yeah. me a break, you know. Right. But um, yeah, so I I started to you know um, get the idea in my head that I needed to take it easy a little bit, you know. But I I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it without a little bit of help, and of course AA and yeah. some of those things, you know, uh, really helped. And friends, you know, uh, that were already starting to get, you know, um, you know, get get getting off of it and meetings and stuff like that. So it really helped. And um, you don't have to mention names, but did you feel like you had people in the business and like other musicians that had kicked that were able to kind of say, Hey man, I got your back. Let's, you know, I want to be a source of support for you. Oh, sure. Cool. Some, of them, um, some of them weren't musicians. They were um, studio guys Yeah. that were uh, there's a good friend at the time, Jimmy Reisel, uh, who's an engineer works with uh, uh, Narda Michael Alden. Oh, nice. He works in that studio tar pen now. At the time, he was just kind of like a local uh, engineer, musician, really great guy. Um, and he helped me with that. Yeah. You know, he brought me to a couple of meetings and then I started getting it myself. And, you know, a little bit of therapy, a little bit, a little bit of that kind of like positive injection really, this really is, helped. This is, you come off the roads, you're in a, on a break after yeah. a tour. So you hit some meetings, you kind of work on some recovery process. Yeah. Yeah, and you guys have a little time off before you start recording again, or what? What happens there? Yeah, what we did is at the end of that it was 1986. I remember it well. Um, when I actually decided to stop, we got it was uh, December 6th, 1986. Okay. And so going into that next year, you know, um, making the fourth album, and um, you know, uh, we were mixing that whole thing. So I, I decided to stop at that point all that year and um got a divorce too you mm. know addiction doesn't help uh relationships at all nope <laughs> you know unless you're both doing it and then that only lasts for a short period yeah yeah but um party ends pretty fast that way yeah you know yeah. and so we we got that record out we um we also um taking that whole year off touring man going into in, uh, sobriety and a whole new look into a, lot, a new life and then having to go and mount a tour and that's what i'm getting about, to that, yeah. oh my god this habit it's not you know it's you're you've gotten sober you've got some months behind you but you go into the place where you actually get yeah. the addiction back in the devil's den man you know all those influences it's like Oh my God. Yeah. What am I going to do here? Yeah. I mean, I got kicked out of an AA meeting too, because I was in Dothan, Alabama, and I didn't know the difference between closed and open oh, right. meetings. Yeah. And I, I wanted to talk about my addiction, which was, you know, cocaine at the time. And the guy didn't, and I, it, you know, that was my fault, but I only yeah. had a date. Oh, but yeah. I needed, to, I needed to talk about it. And he, he just kicked me out. I said, get out. You yeah. can't talk about drugs here. When we're talking about alcohol, and I'm like, you know, drugs and alcohol, same thing. You know, goes, get out. <laughs> for, for somebody that's brand new in recovery, walking into a place like that where you don't feel included and you feel like you don't have support, that's a really dangerous thing, I think, you know, because I think, um, yeah, in your mindset, you're thinking drugs and alcohol, the same thing. And, and you, you, like over time, you realize why they have open and closed meetings, but yeah, for brand new sobriety, you know, you do what you do to stay sober, man. You do what whatever you can do, you know. You do what you got to do to stay sober, and uh, it's cool that you're hitting meetings. You're on the road in Alabama, like on tour when you hit that. Yeah, all right. Yeah. And so then you got you got kicked out, and then you got to go back on the road, and you feel like, like I was like, okay, sure. Why should I care now? Right. You know that whole you know ten year old thing right comes into play. 
Yeah. Oh, you know, I'll show you. Right. <laughs> yeah. And even though um, it's so all for you. I think that I might have, you know, entertained the idea, but I did not. You didn't. Wow. Did not. It did not. Right on. Did not. I did not cave. Uh, I don't know what kept me. Str- what kept me sober is the, the, the assistant tour manager, Tucker, Tucker Williamson, who was with right me. He said, ah, th- this is a test for you. You got to yeah. watch that. You know, so that was really good. Got was, through that. Was the band supportive of you staying sober too and doing the right yeah. thing? Cool. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was tough. Yeah. And I kind of had to isolate myself a little bit from the band sure. because not everybody had the same problem I did. Yeah. You know, and I had to realize that, but I also had to give myself that, you know, I had to stay away from, you know, the after show thing, you know, yeah. I just had to stay yeah. away. And I got myself through that tour. And then, and then the next tour uh, was Man in Motion, did that record. Keith Olsen, that was a great, great um, bond. I, I think we made a great record there, but at the, it was getting towards the end of the 80s and people weren't, music you changed. know, the music was changing and we were, you know, not selling as much. And But we still had that love of music, you know. Yeah. But yeah. we decided after that short tour to, to give it a break. 88, the end of 88 and into that. And we most decided, of those... You're doing on your own. Those are your tours, right? Those are your headliners. We, we, we did a double bill with Kansas. Okay. Okay. Steve Morris was in the band, newly oh, in the band at awesome. that time. So that was fun. Yeah. Really fun. And they were, you know, they were great. And, um, but um, yeah, it was, we, we weren't really drawn that many people anymore. I mean, it was probably smaller venues mm-hmm. going from, you know, arenas to, you know, playing theaters and, Stuff like that. How, man, how what, empty arenas and explain to people about that mindset, right? I mean, I can I know my own personal feelings about it, but for maybe new musicians or somebody that hadn't gotten to that point, right, where you go from playing a fifteen hundred seat auditorium to playing a fifty thousand seat stadium, and then over time, because the industry changes and people's in, yeah. uh, interest change, you're back down to like you know two thousand seaters. What uh, you know, like. How do you go back on stage and generate the same kind of energy, even knowing, all right, this is a, you know, this is kind of a sobering moment, right? I learned, I learned it from uh, our tour manager who had seen that. He had yeah. toured with a lot of people and seen that. And he just said simply, he goes, you play to the ones that come. Yeah, nice. That was all he had to say. Yeah. And that was all we needed to go, yeah, what do we care about? Oh, we're not making millions of dollars, or you know, or whatever. We're not drawing fifteen thousand. It's not about that, man. It's, it's not about it, for it you. It was when we got together, yeah. And that's how it was supposed to stay. Yeah, is that we're supposed to have the love of music, and we always kept that. That's why Night Ranger doesn't. We don't care how many people come. We do, but we're gonna play as hard yeah. and as soulful and with as much love and passion. If there's Dude. five people in there, it's oh. not not gonna matter. Yeah, you know? like having Carrie Kelly in there slamming doesn't hurt either, right? I mean, you just like, yeah. Like, oh my god, know, the dual lead thing that Carrie's got with Brad—that's ridiculous. And Carrie Kelly and Eric Levy, the the, oh. the newest members, we absolutely enjoy those guys. Dude, that guy's we get on stage, player. their smiles and and love of music, pay you know, it comes comes right through as well. Yeah, you know. Virtuoso so, players, man. Eric's a wicked keyboardist. People don't even realize that guy. Have you cla- been seeing some of his posts on Facebook? I, I haven't, but I listened to some of his classically trained stuff, and I'm like, "What, dude? This, he's he's a cat. He's, a, he's he does these jams, man, on Facebook every day. He does something. Okay, new, and he's like, it'll blow your mind. Yeah, he does. Be like, like, I want to play to that. Send me that so I can like put my headphones in. Are, yeah, are you guys doing any of that at sharing like right now? You tr- like trading tracks and doing some distance? You know, I've had um I've had him play on a lot of my demos. So he plays on a lot of my stuff. Carrie too as well. Yeah. Um Carrie, um, I wrote a song with Jim Peterick. Oh yeah, a, Survivor. A big songwriter from Survivor. With purple hair. Yeah, I've been uh, been writing, yeah. And again, I sent it to Carrie and I had him play on it. I always have Eric play keyboards on my demos because you know, you trust these guys, you know, yeah. you, 
you know how, how well they play and um, I'd rather give them the work, you know. Um, you may, but, not, not just je- demos, I mean, you've got records out. I mean, people, you know, should but, check out, you know, you've been a songwriter since the beginning, but I, I sent you the other day because your stuff came up again on mine and uh, I, um, yeah, like this album. So, the, um, yeah, I'm alive. You got I'm alive and time passes. Both of those records. This uh, this one, this little close up of your eye looks. Like oh yeah. You're so uh, like this is a very serious I look. Did the whole? Yeah, I know. I know. That's the one thing. It's like, oh my god, get get off of the serious thing. Stop. Well, you know? No, there's some seriousness in there, you know. But, but Night Ranger has a lightness to some of the music. There's a darkness to the guitars. The guitars are always like the dual guitar thing is always magical. Like, don't tell me, you know. Sure, sure. Is especially when you guys that live. When you see Night Ranger, you don't tell me, love me live, and you've got the big theatric bob, 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 and then silence, and you've got like the the everything goes black, but then you've got the wicked different lighting stuff that you have going on. I know that's a horrible way to describe it, but goosebumps start <laughs> happening, man. You know, like the crowd. It's the perfect intro of any record, any band out on tour. That don't tell me is the. Uh, that's awesome. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you got that. That's that's really cool. But you know, there there is a lightness to the music too. It can't and not campy. But uh, I think like Jack, he's always smiling when he's singing. He's always smiling. So yeah. there, there, there is because we enjoy what we're doing. You know, I mean, the thing is too is where we came from. 60s, 70s music was very melodic. Yeah. And so we come from a very melodic side. Beatles. You know. Led Zeppelin's, yeah. you know, melodic. I mean, there's so many bands, Cream, yeah. Hendrix, that we that were our influences, you know, for for melodies, you know. And so we we like to we like to have that side of it come out in the songwriting. It's Did really you have like a, 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 a vocalist that was an inspiration to you when you were first in those bands in high school? Was it like Plant or definitely definitely a McCartney? Oh, I was. Yeah. I was definitely a McCartney fan. Um, I mean, shoot, you know, it's like a uh, cream. You know, Jack Bruce was an amazing singer. Yeah, Clapton. I mean, their their songs were very melodic. So those those were where I got a lot of that stuff from. And then on the heavier side was Zeppelin, yeah. MC Five, like we talked about earlier. I mean, it's just there was so much great music coming out in the seventies. Great era. You know, Bob Seger came out then too. I mean. Uh, yeah. How about drummers? Like, who was your like first drum influence? You know, it was definitely Ringo. I listened to their performance live at the Hollywood Bowl on my little radio. Oh my gosh! When they broadcast from, you know, because I was living in L.A. at the time, so I, I remember hearing him do "Boys," and I'm like, he, he's singing. Yeah. He's a singing. You know, it's like that's when it first hit me. He's a singing drummer. Wow. I can do this, you know. Yeah. So um, that's how it got started for me, you know? Interesting. Um, that's cool. Yeah, so um, probably back then um, uh, was a, another drummer from uh, Rare Earth. Oh, yeah. Oh. Uh, uh, is, uh, Pete, Pete Rivera. Okay, is, yeah. That... Wow. He, he was the lead singer in the band. Wow. And yeah. also the drummer. Sure, yeah. Dude, like he would do like a full on drum solo, double bass drum, the whole thing, dude. And then he would sing, Your love is fading. You know, all that stuff, man. It was all him playing. It, oh, it was gotta, really a huge influence. That, uh, yeah, I, I've always wondered because you're vocally, your style is unique to me. You know, you got soul in you. You can hear that there's a, there's like a 60s soul sort of undertone. I love the little rasp, the rasp that you've got, you know, and you're not a smoker. I did back then. Yeah, I was okay. a smoker I, back then. I was yeah. wondering because yeah. you've got a smoker's rasp to your voice, you know. Yeah. It's, uh, it's always it's always been like that though. Yeah. That, always had that kind of grit. I love it. You know, it. back in that, back in junior high school, I was in a band that, that did all doors music. Okay. So I thought I was back then I thought I was Jim Morrison. You know? Right. <laughs> so did? I'd do all those, all all the cops, you know, everything that he did, memorize every lyric, and 
you know, knew all the raps, you know, and all the stuff from the end and when the music's over and all those songs. And all the movements and the, uh, the like, oh my God, I yeah. thought it was him. Well, how could for you about, not, right? About six months or a year, I thought it was, I thought it was going to be a Jim Morrison, you know, like the next, yeah, the, the reincarnate. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, okay, so you, you kind of told me a little bit about how you guys came out, it, it came with this attitude of like, you know, we're going to play to the people that are there. And, uh, um, and that really is the best way to go. Because regardless, you got to be appreciative of the fact that people are coming, you know, Kiss was doing the same thing. When you guys started the Creatures of the Night Tour, Kiss was starting to drop, right? And so yeah. they were trying to have to figure out how to play, you know, change from 75,000 seaters to 7,500 seaters. And, um, and so you probably got a little bit of a taste of that from their, their side, but uh, the era changed. So what happened in the record recording and the, the way that things were set up with you guys for the band that helped you realign your priorities? You know what it, you know what it was is that we just kept being creative. I mean, we did have a break there at the end of the eighties um, and Jack, you know, went um, and joined the damn Yankees. Right. So that was a, that was a great, great thing for him is that him. somebody called him up and said hey i got you know i got tommy shaw and ted nugent you want to get together with them and maybe see if it you know if it, if it meshes and see if that works In the meantime i kept writing songs i stayed home didn't play any gigs but i was writing i was still being creative and and then uh, ja uh brad and i did another night ranger uh record with gary moon um, in uh, 1994, 95, okay. we put out a record uh, called Feeding Off the Mojo. There's some good songs on there, but it was still called Night Ranger. But no doubt. It didn't Jack. feel right, though. It didn't feel right. You know, yeah. it's like, you know, when we had the first meetings about that, I was like, I was like, I don't know, man, should we use the name? And nobody was opposed to it. So we just did, you know. But um, one of the record guys says, you know, if, if, if somebody sends me a CD, and it's new and it says Night Ranger. I'm, I'm going to pull it out of the stack of those new songs. And I thought to myself, you know, I don't want to be dead in the water, but at the yeah. same time, I want to be, you know, I want to be forthright about this and go, you know, maybe we shouldn't use the name. And, you know, there was enough people that, that thought we should. And there wasn't any so, animosity. So it's not like, oh, look at Night Ranger is going to no. reform without Jack. And yeah. Like, yeah. And, it, you know, we made a great record too. It was really fun to make and some really good songs on there. But no touring or anything like that? We toured behind it. We played really? clubs and really enjoyed it and okay. jammed. It was a three, it was a three piece band. Yeah. Then we got a second guitar player, David Z from Texas. Okay. Uh, was a great guitar player um, that joined the band after we did that record. Okay. The Jeff Watson and was just out prior. Watson was doing solo stuff. Okay. At the and uh, Fitz was on tour with many bands. He was on tour with, you know, Van Halen, with uh, Sammy's because they were still good friends. Okay. So he was playing keyboards in that under the stage or on the side or whatever. Right. He was still active. Um, Springsteen did a lot of tours. Did, you know, like, uh, um, God, who else? He did a bunch of, bunch of solo artists that, you know, um, Whitney Houston. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Yeah, so Fitz was very active in the in the business, playing keyboards and and being uh, on the side there. With but, well, with, um, with you and Brad doing that record, did you still have label support, or was the the label say? You know, it was it was a small label. It was okay. a very small label. Um, I can't, I'm I'm drawing a blank now because it was like I can't remember what it was. I have it somewhere. Anyway, no, no worries. But we did have a little bit of support from okay. the label. We got. Uh, the song Feeding Off the Mojo uh, got played on some of the stations. Okay. So we, we actually toured across America a little bit and uh, kind of broke the record a, a slight bit. Okay. But, you know, when people came out, we played clubs and we enjoyed the heck out of playing that. That was fun. So at Brad least and I were still get, together. You don't you have know. to sit at home by yourself, which is good. Yeah, yeah. Keep, keep then we busy. came back after that. It was like 1996. And Jack had been, you know, the damn Yankees were done. And he called me up and said, hey, you know, uh, have you gotten any royalties from MCA? Oh, no. Have you, have you been receiving? And I said, as a matter of fact, I haven't. 
And he said, well, what are you doing right now? He said, do you want to get together? You know, and because uh, you know, I'd seen him throughout the, the Yankees tours, oh. I would go and go out and say hi to everybody and you, meet up. So it wasn't like, like we weren't talking. You, know? you didn't go to the shows and go. Yeah. Stand up front and go. <laughs> eh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. All right. No, so you- I, I embraced everybody else's uh, successes and stuff. I always, I'm, that's the way I am. You know? I know. But I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed it I, too. Yeah. I thought that band was a killer, kick Slam, ass, slamming band. Oh my god, really good, you know. And you know, I felt like I'm, you know, I need to get back out there too. And it was perfect timing, you know. Got together with him and Fitz and Jeff, and we got together at Jack's barn, barn out in uh, it was in Santa Rosa. Okay. Got and together his, we said, his barn. Hey, he has a barn that he converted into a studio oh, okay i was gonna say so it's like a total like he built a whole new room inside this old barn it's a hundred year old I, I thought he invited you guys to come over and like shuck hay or something yeah come on yeah like that yeah, yeah. that's right <laughs> that's right shovel shit yeah <laughs> that's how much i think but, of you <laughs> but uh, yeah so we got back together and um re, you know restarted the whole machine again and um you know, made made a couple new records. You know, John Claudner got on board, the famous uh, record man that was yeah. uh, at Geffen, and then he was over at Sony, and and uh, you know, we made made a good record with him, and it was it was great, and toured, got the whole thing started up again. You know, okay, and started to go to Japan, and started to all the things. So you know, we kind of kept that love of playing together alive you yeah know? even though we weren't doing the same thing you know together well, japan still stayed big didn't it you, you guys still had big shows there right yeah we, yeah we we still so that was like i said before was always the first place we would go when we release a record that's exactly what we did yeah you know we went over there and played some shows and you know and rekindled the fire over there again damn um, cr- that was really Such that's cr- always so much Crazy. You know, I've, I've never been, never been to Japan. I thought you went over there with, no, you, you no. haven't been over there with the bands you've been touring with lately? Never. I've had several bands. Uh, what, you book, didn't go book. with a flock? And- no, with, not with flock. flock. I was bu- I was booked for a uh, tour through Japan with a band that I was in called Cleveland that I passed up for a party opportunity in Canada. Dumb, dumb, dumb. Um, yeah. So, and now who knows, but, um, but I know, I mean, I've read about, your fan base and working with Jennifer Batten, I know her fan base over there is rabid. Yeah. You know they yeah. they are um, they are so dedicated to the people that they support that it's like the '60s. It's like the Beatles. You know when you guys come yeah, there, they, I've seen your they DVD. They love American music. Yeah, they love American music, pop music in general. They have their own huge stars over there too. Right. You know the bees. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, but, but so you start. You can still go there. You start the tours off, they're huge. You can still come yep. back at that point in the 90s, late 90s. You've got uh, new label support, new management as well. Yeah, we, we've gone through a few managers at the time. Okay. Uh, back then, making records. Um, you know, it just happens. You don't click with everybody. But um, we, we kept making mu- music. That was the most important thing. You bet. And we got labels involved even if we didn't really have a manager we kept rolling with music cool you know i mean that was the most important thing so you know um and we made some good records back then even nobody not a whole lot of people heard of an album called neverland we made you know um somewhere in california our last one is really good you know don't let up i mean yeah it's a great record we, we just keep being creative we're in the middle of well we're getting started with a new one um, we're going to have to do it virtually right now. We'll just send sessions and whatever and ideas, but eventually we'll be able to get together and, and actually, you know, write it, you know? Do you guys so, all have some way to record? I know you've got a studio there at your place, it, right? And, uh, I do. I mean, yeah. I have, you know, I, I have Pro Tools. I have microphones. I, I have, you know, I could turn it around here and got it. Oh yeah, baby. Look at that. And there's a, there's a, kick-ass acoustic kit right there kelly's yep. new black dw kit with the yep, I, I have it on the road for many many years now i have 
here at home. God. And uh, <clears throat> so I got that going on. I can make, you know, I can record good demos here, I think, yeah. get it good enough sounds. I mean, you know, we'll see. Um, well, always, I can always uh, do what I did with Nashville. Um, I did have a good recording room there. So the last record, Don't Let Up, was actually recorded in my home. Oh, really? Okay. <clears throat> with no samples. <clears throat> didn't use the samples. We just got a good sound on the right. drums. And uh, Anthony Fox was was a good friend of mine who's, a, I don't know, you might know, yeah. know Anthony. Yeah, of course. Yeah. That, yeah. So he, he did the last record? Yeah, he's done the last three records. Okay, very cool. So um, he engineered it. He came over and helped me get the sound. But, uh, you know, I mean, I can go into a studio here and nice room and good mics and record the drums there if I need to. But for right now, we while we're writing, we're just going to do this. And, you know, they can send me a session, Pro Tools session, I open it up, record it, send it back to them. Carrie has Pro Tools. Brad has something like Pro Tools, I think. And we can all put our parts on and get it going that way. Yeah, you guys, you, you all in different places in the country, though. So you got Jack's up in the Northwest off Whitby, right? And then you got um, yeah, he's up uh, by Brad's you. Over, he's up there. Brad's in the Bay Area. Uh, you're in Arizona. Brad's in the Bay Area. So is Eric. Okay. Yeah. Eric Kelly's in in Orange County, LA. Okay. What brought you from Nashville to Phoenix? Was it Jen? You know, um, yes. <laughs> it was Jennifer. Yeah, of course. I met her like four years ago, almost four years ago to the day. Wow. <clears throat> I met her when I was playing. I actually didn't meet her. You know, she came to a meet and greet, but I didn't really meet her. But I saw her face and she was in the audience. Like this is a good story. We yeah. played at, at, the, uh, at the local casino over here and I saw her. And then she just sent a message to the band saying, enjoyed the show and I saw her face and I was like, oh my God, there's that girl I saw. And then four years ago, um, we, you know, we, we started dating and, and. Um, Hold on a second. Thought, there's a little bit, you missed a little bit there. So she, she saw you, she fell for you. You had seen her in the crowd. So a mm -hmm. little spark went off in there and she reached out to the band. How does that happen where a girl writes to the band and says, I really enjoyed your show. It's Facebook. How does Kelly end up landing the dream the girl of his dreams out of that email oh my God. yeah it was a it was a facebook message and i just saw a picture that she had left on there and i was like that's that girl, that's girl. while i was playing i was so distracted playing that show first time ever in my life i was like i, I kept trying to like not look at her yeah you know? and then but it's her but her face is so distinctive yeah so, like and she just like look over at me and it was like, oh my God. You're stuck. This is my band. And I kept playing and finally it was like, oh, I got to connect with this person a couple of weeks ago. And it so, went by and I, it, I had to do it. You reach back on a Facebook and say, hey, let's grab copy. Yeah. I just, you know, I was very cautious because I didn't know her. Yeah. But she I did, did after she, that show. But she's I, in Arizona, to, Nashville. She is in, yeah, exactly. I was living in Nashville. And, um, kept you know touring and, and i finally saw that message on it was a private message too i think but it was to the band yeah. saying hey i really enjoyed the show and blah 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 hope you come again and and, and so i went ah it's her she's mine I reached out to her and, <laughs> and eventually we made a date to to see each other in person and it was about a month later i think did she come to and you or did you go to her I um I actually she was in Chicago where all of her family lives. Okay. She happened to be visiting, and I happened to be doing a show on the at the Navy base oh, in uh, in the in Chicago, and I invited her out to just come say hi and shook her hand and hi, how are you? You know, and we talked a little bit, but then we started the whole thing up. Ah. We started talking every day, and pretty soon I just fell in love with her and couldn't live without her. <laughs> Four years later, man. His honeymoon's still happening. You know, <laughs> Unbelievable. It's, it's cool. You know, what's really neat, I don't know what point from after that you got to meet her family. But yeah. as, as I found, her family, this really large extended family that just, I don't know, man, I expected it to be fiery tempered, a little metal, you know, like a Mediterranean kind <laughs> of like, a, like, but it was lots of hugs, which I absolutely love. And uh, yep. so, so much warmth and empathy. And 
thought, oh my God, that must have been the coolest thing for you to walk into. You've had previous oh, yeah. re- previous marriages that maybe didn't work out so well. Yeah, walk, yeah. walk into this family that looks like they're just, uh, you know. They totally embrace me um, and the whole idea of her and I, and <clears throat> they are the best. They're a Lebanese family. Yeah. So they, it's huge cousins, aunts, uncles. Yeah. I mean, it was like, you know, you saw, it was like I did. <clears throat> three quarters of the people that came were, you know, the, her extended family. Yeah. And uh, um, it was such a joy and a, a treat to have all those folks be, uh, you know, like embrace me coming in and my history. It was spirited. It was spirited. You know, that's what I thought yeah. about that that wedding. It was, uh, yeah, I, you know, honestly, I, I showed up, I was in a rough mood. Honestly, been kind of a tough, tough patch. And I walked in and all those people just took me in like family. And you guys had the most hilarious intro. You come into the suit with doing the Super Bowl shuffle. That's how your processional was <laughs> coming back into rece- in this receiving line afterwards. And <laughs> I couldn't believe the two of you had all the moves down for the Super Bowl shuffle. And uh, I totally uh, blew her mind. I was a surprise. She didn't expect that. Oh, my God. Right, yeah. because they're such God, that was they're great, Chicago Bears fans from the time they grow up this high. They have <clears> big so, time. Um, Brain, brainwashed. So I, I totally sprung that on her when we got halfway down the aisle, and then that song started. Right. Wait a minute, you just surprised her on the spot. Yeah, because she had all the moves. She knew all the words. Like, well, I guess that's part of the deal. You're Chicago. That's part uh, of it. It's totally part of it. And she just looked yeah. at me and went, ah! and "Oh, so, that's doing the awesome. whole thing." And they all. Did you notice everybody started singing it too? Oh and yeah, and then the family, <laughs> yeah. But it was uh, it was it, your band members were all there, it's, it's, you know, fully supporting you and they're, as your groomsmen, and it was pretty pretty amazing, man. Nice to see everybody in a tux, you know. Oh my god, and and uh, my my one of my oldest girlfriends, not never romantic, but uh, Maria Poole, I had her walk me down the aisle, and and um, she's become such a, a great friend to Jen. And become really close and and uh, she uh, came out with her husband Henry and you know just uh, we just had such a great bonding with part of my family and her family and it was a it was a great it was a great way to to end that year last year big time man I, uh, you know you can kind of tell when some relationships aren't going to work out by what happens at the wedding you know but that that yeah. one that one to me i thought it was the, it was the perfect wedding it was so lighthearted you had the brief ceremony but um your minister was so great and he he did all oh, this wasn't tri- he, great? he was awesome but he did all his trivia he knew about you know all the you know sister christian sort of details oh yeah he, that, was, he sprung that on me that, that was that, was a, <clears throat> that yeah. was a surprise too when he did all that kind of dialogue we just watched the video it just got finished three days ago and we just watched it yesterday in its entirety it was amazing that's just like we just really i mean it it brought all those all that vibe back that you were just talking about good special all those people in one room and having a good time and the music was perfect and and you you had a little break before you were heading back over to japan right and yeah and um at that point you were going back back out to do the double record shows you had the yeah. Dawn Patrol, Midnight Madness, uh, just doing. You basically do start to finish each record yeah. with with a short break in between. Is that right? Short break uh, in between with some acoustic songs from some of the other albums. Wow. So we didn't leave, want to leave the other albums out. Yeah. So we would do them acoustically or in a different way. Then we would end the night with songs that I mean, it, it was so weird. Some of our albums like. Uh, the the second album, Madness, ended with an acoustic song. Oh yeah, ended with a song called "Let Them Run." Right, which is a great song. So we decided to kind of change things up a little bit, and and uh, so, but we would end the whole night with "Goodbye," which was really oh. poignant. That was perfect. Yeah. And some of the other songs um, from the the third and fourth album. So okay. So, but but doing them in a row like that is really a treat because. For us too. Yeah. It's really a challenge too to try to pull that off and make it. I lost um, the band's trying to chime in on that. that. We were supposed to do a call right now. Oh, they just jumped in? A band, a band call, yeah. Uh, They're okay. trying to call me. But I, yeah. I'll get to that. Bring them on in. Yeah, I wish. Who who you have in there? I don't know. Yeah, like... 
I think it's the whole band and crew right now. Are they trying to zoom you? I think they are. Yeah, add them to the call. We'll say it. We'll uh, we'll make fun of Brad's sex face and uh, and. Uh, <laughs> and well, I don't want to cut off like work time. I know that we went longer than I expected to. But well, I, it was yeah, it was supposed to be a business meeting. Oh too. I'm God. sorry. But you Great know, time. we can we can we can kind of wrap things up a little short. Let me just tell you a couple of things that were really um, important that I wanted to get to. You've developed some relationships because of the partnerships you've had in bands where you toured with like Journey a bunch and yes. Foreigner. Um, along the Journey lines, Dean Castronovo, man, oh one of the, like a, our brother, right? Like Absolutely. Another. From the beginning, too, when I first met Dean, before he did some of the other stints in the other bands, he was with the Wild Dogs, which right. which you know is from your hometown. Yeah, well, where I'm living, yeah. That's right. And and so when I first heard him play, uh, it was behind closed doors and we were uh, getting ready and setting up to rehearse in, in uh, Marin County in San Rafael. And they were rehearsing with Tony next door and I could hear this guy playing and I'm like, I never heard playing like that in my life. Wow. You know, I was still like 80s bands. And, yep. you know, but they were playing this like ungodly, like metal right instrumental crazy fast as they can do accurate yeah you know blew everybody's mind and i was hearing him play and i was like who are that you know it's like blown away and there was a hole in the wall in my little storage area where i my drum equipment was and i go i, I, I want to see if i can see in there <laughs> i bend down and i see i see dino playing this gigantic kit and at the time when i when i saw him playing he was playing with one hand oh so he's God. like he's like a one of those things yeah and he's like reaching down picking something up oh. while he's still playing and i'm like i'm like this mother you know yeah I, just, yeah I was like who is this guy so when the music stopped i went over there and introduced myself and we've been friends ever since. Since and the I, Wild I Dogs. Had to look at all his equipment and set behind his drum set. A lot of his cymbals were broken. Oh yeah. I was like, I was like, oh my god. I go, let me help you out here. Let me throw you a couple of cymbals and let, let's replace some of these gross, broken cymbals. So that's how I met Dino. No way. He fast friends. I gave him. I don't know. I must have gave him four or five cymbals to yeah. replace the broken ones that he had. And he always tells that story. I was like, this guy gave me my first set of symbols and blah, 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 you know, it was, you know, it was really fun. You started the trend, man, because he's really known for being very philanthropic and he's very generous, you know, with his stuff too. I know a lot of schools and, and musicians in like in uh, Salem area, he's hooked those guys all up with drum equipment. It seems like you always hear about some kid who wants to play drums, but couldn't afford one. And all of a sudden they have this badass DW drum set that came from Dean, you know? Oh it's, my God. That but, is incredible. But but you started he's the always, trend, you know? He's, he's always, you know. I, it was all because of I, you. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, but, but I think he's always had that in his heart anyway. He's like one of those really sweetheart guys. Big time. And he's, you know, he came to your rescue when you had a heart scare. And uh, not just a scare. There was a there was a life in yeah. that situation for uh, Kelly Kigi a few years ago. Well, it's weird when, when, you, when you're faced with that and the doctor's saying, look, you know, you know, it's, it could be catastrophic. You could be on stage and he, and I'm like going, are you kidding me? He goes, yeah, I hate to tell you, but so I had to make that decision of going and having a, a valve replaced in my heart, which was defective from birth. You know? yeah. And, and not really having any heavy symptoms, you know, but having a doctor say this happens, you know, people die from this every day yeah. and not have any symptoms. He said, so you should take care of it, you know? Um, and so I did in uh, 2017. It was, a, it was a huge decision, man, to make because I thought I was going to take myself out of playing, yeah. you know? Because you never know if you're going to be able to recover and That's actually serious. do it. Plus, being a singer, too, you, a lot of energy used up that way, too. So, um, but it, it turned out good. It, I got all healed up and... yeah. And, got back in full full strength and even better and then you got some help along the way yeah with dino with, with, 
Yeah, exactly. Yes. So, so there were shows that you had to go out and Dean actually had to come out and play drums and sing. And he came out and played, uh, I think it was three or four shows he filled in for me. Um, also, um, you know, um, he, came, uh, he came in and played and I sang um, when I was just breaking back in. Okay. Uh, Fred Corey played. Oh, yeah. Uh, about three shows or okay. two, two or three shows, I think. Um, but but Dino, Dino started playing with us when we were on tour with him in in uh, 2011 or 12. Seeing that, where you just bring him up to do Sister Christian, like just to play with you. He just started showing up. Yeah. You know, <laughs> he so was like, like, what are you going to say? No, no, no. Right. No, no, I don't want you to play today. Right, he just, just like he would just like in the, the the keyboard intro, and then you know I would go out and to entertain the audience and sing, and then I'd, I'd go to make my way back to the drum set to, to start the song, <laughs> and there he's sitting, and he would just like it's, he started ignoring me. He'd like be like touching the cymbals and pretending like you don't. He doesn't. Know. And I'd go back to the drum set, and he's sitting there. I'm like, oh, my oh God. yeah, okay. I, I guess what am doing I gonna it? do? Right. That's it. All right, kids. That's how you do it. Just in case you want to learn how to sit in with a band. <laughs> I know. Can they go up front? Run back behind the drums, hop on the kit, right? That's um exactly. God, I think uh it's fun to watch it's fun to watch that camaraderie, right? And you're both great dudes, oh. great hearted, you know, and uh incredible drummers, you know. I um I don't I don't know if they they if the rest of the band um cared whether he did that i don't know if he did it you know i think neil once in a while would go why don't you not play tonight right you know? oh oh the deal yeah. i want to play the I journey guys play. yeah you can't stop me yeah but, <laughs> well it's uh it just shows that you know it's there was a spirit on stage with that tour with uh journey foreigner night ranger i remember she like shulman on drums on with foreigner yeah. you know so like oh my all, God. All, all three of you guys like what a trifecta for drum fans right to get to go out there and see you guys slaying together oh it was great watching both of them every night i mean mark is such a tremendous player and yeah. great group and he's a rock star i mean like yeah, he is you know he he's filling in but he's he's like embracing okay i'm gonna go out and i'm gonna yeah. i'm gonna leave my mark on this you know yeah oh so, always you always Huge. know, yeah. Mark walks into a room, you know Shulman's there, and he uh, yeah. and he leaves, and you'll still feel him there, you know. Yeah, that's, that's right. And, and another cat who's a Portland, you know, expat. So that um, I, I think um, there are you know family type things and and fun sort of stories that we could reminisce about. But I know you have oh, a right. business call. I uh, I just I want to take you back to a couple memories just that I, yeah. I love and I cherish, man. Um, one of the things I'll never forget. Was spending that weekend in Seattle. We got to uh, hit yeah. the re record stores up at uh, Pike Place Market, watching the fireworks up over the Space Needle on New Year's Eve. That was huge, man! Amazing. Loved I mean, it. Bitter cold, coldest night on. Oh my god! Day. But, but I um yeah I, I just remember magical times with Football you guys. Game. Yeah, we got to go watch the Hawks and the Cards, man. That was amazing yeah. too. Go Hawks! Really? And oh my god, what an um, amazing generous gift too to, to get my steve largent picture from you guys but thank you for that i uh i am just i'm hopeful that during this time the um the pandemic can kind of leave you guys with a little bit of positive reflection where you can really appreciate the time that you have you and jen together and then the band can kind of use this as a time to recharge and look at you know putting energy towards something even bigger and more impactful than you ever have you know it's a that collective unit that you have in a band is kind of like what we all need right now to be able to stick together and kind of fortify oh, each other you know huge man i mean the thing is too is that when i mean for one thing when's the last time you had summer a summer yeah. off you Never. know it's like i'm going to take advantage of this big time you know i have a new wife I want to spend time with her mm -hmm. I, don't to, I don't have to get on a plane every other day yeah you know and I think that it, it also makes you rethink the way we all live together. Yeah. It's going to change all that. It will. And, you know, a reopening, I, I'm kind of afraid of that. Reopening yeah. too soon. Yeah. You know, I, I know that they're kind of like with an iron fist, they're trying to say you can't do it, especially like where you live. But um, they're also doing that here too. But they're just trying to protect us. Yeah. I, I think the government's just trying to protect us. The president 
and all of them, you know? I mean, if science dictates that this is what happens when people get together too soon, then the, the spike comes back up. I believe in science, man, you know? And so I'm, I don't want to live in fear, but I'm also going to protect myself and my family. You know, I've got exactly. family to, to look out for. And, um, but as we do that, you know, it's just important to be able to sort of retain, retain this community sense, even if we can't be physically in the same room. Right. I see people kind of coming apart at the seams on social media for right now. Oh, so yeah. Friends, it's, it's a real tough time, both economically and um, because there's so much uncertainty about the future, the planet. I think the only thing that we can really do is look at what we've got right here in front of us that we have control over and exactly. be considerate to each other, just be really good, kind people. And I, that's one of the, the traits that you've always had since I've known you. So pre-pandemic and post, man, I still got one of the most amazing, beautiful friends that uh, I'll never, uh, I'll never let go. So of. great, Kevin. I'm, I'm so glad we got a chance to, to kind of share our feelings now and, you know, I mean, and this is stressful. It's really, really stressful on everybody. Yeah. Us too. Yeah. You know, I mean, we got bills to pay. We got pay, people we have to pay. We don't, yeah. you know, it's it's not easy. Yeah. You know, we're we're struggling right now too. And thank God that we can we can tap into some of those resources a little bit to you know monetarily yeah. to, to to do that. But at the same time, money aside, yeah, we need each other. We really do. Us. You're right, man. It, yeah. We have to pull ourselves together as Americans, as human beings, yeah, you know, and yeah, help like, each other through this. And, and, you know, and it really is beyond America, as you know, man. It, it really is, guys. You guys have so many friends and and you know people all over the world. When I talk to friends in Europe and Asia and Australia, and they, uh, you know, they're all facing the same kinds of things that we are. You know, in different sort of political environment sometimes, but at least they're all faced with economic uncertainty and yeah. their, their medical fears and all those things. And so if there's that continuity and commonality, it just seems like that is what can lend people some sort of unity together, you know? Yeah. And I, I didn't mean to sit on the soapbox. I just really, no, no, no. I love that um, the traits that you exemplify and just being a dignified person who's compassionate and really cares about people that's what I want to keep in my close circle all the time. You know, I, my, my time for self-reflection is to look at what's detrimental and, ex, you know, just kind of purge that stuff. Oh. It's not like I'm thinning my friends list. What I'm saying is purge all sorts of things that are not, that are detrimental to the well-being, and, and make sure that the people I surround myself with are along that same sort of trajectory, right? Where we're looking out for each other. We care about each other. doesn't matter what politic or race or, uh, you know, or, you know, gender, whatever, it's more about being good, dignified people. And so, and then oh, you want that to project that to other people, man. Yeah, man. All like, those people that surround you, that becomes very powerful. I think you so. Want, you want to give that to other people and let them take yeah. it to, to their friends and their family. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a, an important time right now that we do that. You're right. You're right. So when you hop on this business call that you have with Night Ranger, right when we get off the phone, I want you to say, "All right, guys, team, here we go." <laughs> here we go. <laughs> yeah. All right, like, what are you doing? Well, you know. And you're you're, you're the cheerleader, <laughs> no, no, man. We're gonna, you're the we're champion. Pull it together, buddy. Yep. You toast them for me. We please let them know. Kevy Metal says, "I love you." Absolutely. Here, here's, will, to, here's to uh, the boys and Night Ranger. Here's to your beautiful bride. And uh, and I, again, I really appreciate you hanging out with me this afternoon. Let's. Oh man. Let's, Let's not let's, wait until. Let's I'm, do it again. Let's do it again soon, man. I love, I love you, brother. You take care too. Thank you, buddy. All right, man. All right. I love to everybody. See you, pal. See you, bud. See you, man.